Okay. This is the second time I'm trying this. The first time the phone snapped out while I was praying. Just flew right out at me. I don't know if God was trying to get my attention or what. Uh, but we're going to be in Revelation chapter... I'm going to scoop this up a little bit. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. And uh, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and get into it. Uh, we'll talk about prayer requests uh, as I post this. And uh, but I know real quickly you're gonna pray for Sister Pat, pray for Tyler, uh, pray for Brother Noah and Sister Sheila, and uh, just keep them lifted up. All the healthcare workers, pray for the church, pray for each other, and uh, any other ones we'll get uh, later. Pray for Corey and 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 uh, Herbie and Josh and all those guys. We'll, we we should get updates on those uh, this evening, hopefully. Um, if as folks can, I know that uh, sometimes folks don't see these till the next day or something like that, and that's fine. Uh, virtual again on Sunday until, you know, we keep a good eye on the cases and they come down, then we'll do parking lot church uh, there eventually. Uh, but remember to pray for the church, pray for the pastors that are dealing with this. Uh, and uh, I just talked to my landlady yesterday and she said that she's had it. Uh, her kids have had it. Her dad's had it three times and uh, it's just crazy. So y'all, y'all just pray uh, for this situation. Um, Revelation chapter three. We're going to get started here in just a second. I'm going to pray and then we'll go. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. I pray look after us and keep us safe. Help me as I teach. Father, I pray God, let your word instruct us and guide us and, and teach us those things that we need to see. Father, help us to see things deeper than even what I bring out. Father, let the Holy Spirit do the real work. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask God you take care of all these prayer requests and those that are sick and, and healing. <coughs> And Father, we just ask God you bless the healthcare workers, look after them, and uh, and those traveling. We ask these things in Jesus' name, Amen. Real quick, I do want to say I don't know if he's back yet or not, but Carmen sent me a message. Um, Lawrence is traveling with uh, with uh, uh, the uh, director of missions. That's twice I forgot that I couldn't remember a while ago either. Uh, they're going to Louisiana, I think she said, to work on a building that was housing food. So y'all pray for them. God keep them safe and keep that stinking virus off of them and away from them. Uh, but anyway, y'all y'all remember him and 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 just I mean, that's a good work that needs to be done. I'm sure, and uh, I'm I'm glad that Lawrence gets to do things like that. Um, and I know he is too. I know they have a good time whenever they travel. Um, so let's look at the Church of Sardis, Revelation chapter three. We're going to read down through verse uh, six. It says and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father before his, and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Get my notes lined up here. Um, so Sardis... Uh, it was the capital city of Lydia, and uh, it was it was a pretty big place. Um, it was situated in such a way that some of the major roads came through there. It became a natural place to trade, a natural place to stop. Uh, it boasts some of the greatest Roman ar architecture from the periods that it was you know big. Uh, there was uh, temples. Uh, there was a giant uh, bathhouse slash gymnasium, and it was big enough that there was a synagogue started in it, and it ended up being one of the biggest synagogues in the world. Um, some of the architecture remains today. It's been restored. Uh, just really incredible work. You can look it up on Wikipedia, and you'll find things, I'm sure, that I don't bring out because I'm just kind of getting the highlights, but that's where I looked it up, and, and I mean, some of the, the artwork. There was a 3D, um, it, it looked like a wall, but it, they had placed a tile so it looked like a bunch of 3D cubes. It was really neat to see just how meticulous they were. Uh, very detailed stuff. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got sinus drainage and everything. It's been a mess, but y'all just pray pray for me. Um, 
there was an earthquake in 17 AD and the emperor uh, at the time, well, I think it was Tiberius, he sent, I, I think it was uh, 10 million, I may be way off on that number, uh, workers to come help rebuild the city. And uh, I'm sure not all at one time, but also uh, they had this, this five year uh, uh, moratorium on taxes. They didn't have to pay taxes while they were rebuilding the city. And, uh, you know, you, you think that's, that's kind of an incredible thing. But the reason why is because it was an incredible city. Uh, Sardis, which, you know, uh, I, I told you in the beginning meant red ones, and, and I'm sure there's a translation that does mean that. It also means a, a son of bounty or fullness or plenty. Um, and if you look at this city, there was, there was a stream that flowed through it, and there was gold dust in it. And they figured out a way to separate gold and silver and, and to purify it. And so that meant that they had gold that was almost as pure as you could get it, uh, or, or it was almost completely pure. And that gold became very reliable, and people would, would you know, if it came from Sardis, they knew that it was pure gold. The thing about it is um, that made them very wealthy. It completely changed their economy, and they went from being, you know, I'm not going to say they, they weren't wealthy before because they were a trade hub, but it just kicked it up another notch. So you can imagine this was this is a very in vogue place to be. This would be like living in L.A. or living in New York uh, right now. And, and at the height of things, it was a very busy place. If you look now, there's uh, still Roman shops standing today. Uh, the the way it was described was there was a spur of rock that kind of stuck up, and and that's where they kind of kept the citadel. So it was it was like. Uh, um, you know, it, kind of it's back against a wall, basically, so they could defend it. But uh, it was a very, um, it was a very happening place. So whenever John writes this letter, and I'm going to call this Sardis, the Church of the Living Dead, um, and I stole that title, but it was really catchy and it made sense because of that, that first verse. He says, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. This church had a dual nature. And um, if you look here, it says this. It says, I know thou works that thou hast a name that thou livest. That first nature was in name, it was living. Uh, but the reality was it was dead as a doornail. And whenever you look at this verse, it reminds me of what the modern church basically is. We've gotten to a point to where we are... Uh, you know, we have a name that's living. The church is active and it's growing and, uh, you know, all this stuff. People coming to church and, oh, I belong to the church. And, oh, this church helps so-and-so. And we're going to live stream this church service. And there's a name that it's living. But in reality, there's a lot of dead churches. And churches can be dead for a variety of different reasons. We always take it to sin. But sometimes, I mean, it, it always comes back to sin, I guess, technically. But but it's not always the same way. Um churches can die for a lot of different reasons like um the spirit of worship could die in a church <coughs> excuse me the spirit of worship could die in a church and uh it could cause you know the the church over time to just decline uh it could be a spiritual thing like that it, it could be the song service and, and i know that sounds silly but you know, if the song service is dead and dry and dull, uh, or if it's too carnal, um, it can it can ruin a church. You can attract the wrong crowd, or you can push the the, the right crowd out. Um, but that can ruin a church service. If the church isn't serving its community like it should, if it's not serving itself like it should, if it's not serving the Lord like it should, and most importantly, the Lord. You say, "What are you talking about serving the community?" And I'm not saying that that church is is a social. Uh, it is for social welfare. I don't believe that. But I believe the church should serve the community. Now, let me just... I hadn't said anything about the paintballs on the door. And and I'm going to say this. First of all, there are, are goofballs everywhere. All right? It doesn't surprise me that someone shot the church doors with paintballs. It is aggravating. And I understand Sheila's point. She said that, uh, you know, she didn't want to pray for reckoning on these souls. And, and I agree with that. That's... It just makes her her job harder. Uh, but the problem is, whenever you you look at that, 
it's really easy to say, well, the community doesn't care about us. I'm not going to compare. I'm not going to care about them. But if Jesus was around, all right, and someone shot the temple doors with paintballs, and and I know this is a stretch. <clears throat> He would rebuke them, sure, if if he had a chance to, and and they they were there. But I think more than that, because Jesus dealt with sinners pretty much the same way every time he met them, he would be more interested in their soul than he did than he would about their sin. And whenever Jesus shows up to the woman at the well, he doesn't immediately say, "You're an adulterer. You've been fornicating with men." He doesn't say that at all. He says, "Give me a drink." And as it goes, she reveals herself to him, and then he shows her that he knows more than she. <clears throat> then she lets on. Uh, so I think, you know, the Lord would go to that person and, and try to win them. I don't think it would be a thing where he'd go to them and whoop their tail. Now, that being said, it's easy to, to, to see something like that and get jaded about your community. And it's easy to get jaded about helping people. And it's easy to get jaded because it seems like you never get anything, anything for that. But I promise you, there is a God in heaven that watches how we handle situations. And he is watching you and he's trying to see how you're going to react. Uh, I don't like it. It's aggravating. I wish whatever hooligan was running around shooting stuff with yellow paintballs would quit. Uh, and and hopefully it's not some of them youngins that live around there that just ain't got no sense. Uh, and then deciding it's a fun thing to do. But at the same time, they're human. And I would say that if we as a church started praying that God convict their hearts, they'd get right. Uh, they'd, they'd be uneasy anyway. And that's how I'm praying that God just make them uneasy about the things they're doing that they would get right. At the same time, though, what the community expects us to do is to be dignified about it. Clean it up and go on. There's no reason to raise a fuss. There's no reason to throw up signs. There's no reason to be mean or hateful or spiteful. And if we find out who did it, there's no reason to press charges. We can approach them. We can talk to them. But there's no reason to press charges. I promise you that the way we handle this is a, is a reflection on the church. We ought to handle it the way the Lord would. And he'd be more concerned about their soul than their sin. Now, I'm glad I got that out of my system. That just kind of popped on my head. But whenever you serve the community and you don't get any results, it, you get jaded about it. So a church can die like that. Uh, uh, serving yourself. You say, what is it talking? What are you talking about serving yourself? Well, the church should serve its people. Um, you should serve each other just like your hands and your arms and your legs and your feet serve your body, right? They move around, they grab things, they carry things, they pick things up, they get you from one place to the other. That's the same way the church should do. And if the church gets to where it, it's just kind of paralyzed and dying, uh, then it's hard for the church to serve its needs, to serve its purpose. Okay, on top of that, we've got, uh, let me check the time here, we've got, um, you know, serving the Lord, and that's the most important. If we're not serving the Lord, and we're not doing what God's asked us to do, then we're no, we're no good, we're of no use, and that will kill a church. Oh yeah, you're a church, Elkhorn Baptist Church exists, but is it alive? And I know that, that the easiest thing to do is to point fingers and say, well, right now we're not, we can't have church because preachers got us having these virtual services. And, 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 and it's not just the, our, our church. There are other churches too. And it's easy to, to have virtual services and think, well, we're not doing enough for the Lord. You know what? I think staying ourselves safe and keeping ourselves well and, and helping people as we can and, and carrying on the function of the church without meeting at the church is just as good as meeting at the church. We're having service on Sunday. You get a watch service. And if you don't get a watch service, you let me know if something's up. If I have to, to find a way to get you something, I'll try my best to or put it on a platform that you can watch it. But I promise you, I promise you that if we'll still serve the Lord in the capacity that we're allowed to, i.e. you go to the gas station, you witness to somebody, maybe if you get a chance to, you sit down at the grocery store, you get a chance to witness to somebody, you're at the doctor's office, you get a chance to witness to somebody, or invite people to church, or pray with people, or tell people you'll pray for them, or be just someone they can talk to, I promise you, God honors effort. And even though we're not in the building physically right now, I promise you that God honors effort. If you'll put forth effort during this time, God will honor it later. Now, uh, I don't mean to keep harping on us having virtual services, and I really hate 
having virtual services. It bothers me. I feel like I don't get enough accomplished. I don't get enough said. And I feel like that, you know, it just goes against everything I was ever taught. But at the same time, whenever there's over a thousand cases in the county and and we're exposed and don't know it. And, and I, I mean, I would have showed up to church just like normal. There's a good chance because I felt well, I would have talked to people. I would hate to have thought that I carried COVID into the church and caused trouble. This church was a church that had a name that was living. People knew there was a church in Sardis. I'm sure it was talked about. Hey, yeah, there's a happening church over there. People go there every Sunday. And it, it had a reputation for being alive. But God said it is dead. And that's a spiritual death. And it's not good. And uh, and I, I've been in churches like that. Some churches uh, are alive. But on the inside, they are dead as, as three o'clock. Now, um, there was a dual nature, but I want you to know there was a duty, John said, they had to the dying. Look in verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Uh, so, John says, not everything is dead, but there's definitely stuff dying. And uh, I want you to know that you have a job to do for that stuff as well. Now, this church doesn't represent us in church prophecy, but I want to say this. Uh, you have you have an obligation to the church. And I understand, now, I, in, in this aspect, I'm talking about the, the, the body of Christ, the universal church, as it's called, where every saved believer, if the church is in decline, you don't have to be. All right? If the church is in decline, you don't have to give in to that. You don't have to accept that. You have a duty. The first one is to be watchful. It's your duty to be watchful for your church. And if something comes in, it's your duty as a Christian to say something. The first person you should say something to is the Lord. The second person you should say something to is the person causing the problem. The second person you should say something to if that doesn't work, I mean, there's a whole chapter on this in Matthew. You you get that person and two witnesses, and you talk to them that way. Now, that's that's if there's a problem in a in a specific church. But say we're going to our church, and you find out that there's someone teaching Calvinism at another church, then you need to let someone know that that's going on in that other church, so that they can they can make a move. There's no need to watch that church suffer and die, or or to you know go through the ordeal of Calvinism. Uh, you know, t t tulip Calvinism, the the uh, you know predestination election, all that stuff. You have a duty as a Christian to be watching out for your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're watching about doctrine. Okay, you want to watch the doctrine that comes into your church. Uh, you want to make sure that it's not doctrine that is is going to lead you astray and going to mess you up. The next thing you need to look out for is dealings. You need to look out for the dealings uh, that 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 your church is involved in, right? You don't want to be involved with a bunch of crooks uh, to give you a bad reputation. Uh, and you say, well, you know, we're supposed to be love, you know, love the sin or hate the sin, sure. But there's something to be said about you know teaming up with a, a used car lot that's known for selling lemons to accomplish this thing or that thing. Be careful with your dealings. Be careful how you handle the things that go on in the church as far as that goes. And then you got to be watchful about what you're delighting in. Because I've been in some spiteful churches before that delight in knowing that they've given this person or that person a hard time as a whole. Uh, or, or they delight in having been given a hard time. They wear it like a badge of honor, like someone went off on them and threw a fit. And they live in that moment and they stay a perpetual victim and they delight in that, or they delight in a sin that goes on in the church. There's many things they can delight in. Bottom line is, you got to be careful what you're delighting in as a church. And, and as a church, you should be watching that and figuring out, you know, what it is your church is taking pride in. Is it taking pride in itself, or is it taking pride in the Lord? Is it taking pride in its attitude uh, because they have a bad attitude, or is it taking pride in its love and compassion because that's what God wants them to do? And, and not pride in it in a bad way, but pride in the fact that, uh, they're proud that God is is loving and compassionate to the world, and they're able to give it, you know, give that to the world. Um, 
as in pride and a job well done, basically is what I'm saying. So you need to be watchful of doctrine, dealings, and delight. Also, it says not only be watchful, but he says in verse 2, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Now, notice John isn't hopeful, right? He says these things are going to die. He says, though, be watchful and strengthen it. So you should do your best to exhort each other and, you know, hey, come on, we can do this. Kind of pep talk each other, but edify each other, build each other up. Not in a way that makes people pompous, but in a way that says, hey, God has got your back in this and God loves you. And God's going to take care of you, and, and God's God's watching out for us. You got to be watchful and strengthen. These are the duty to the dying. Okay, so there's a dual nature. There's duty to the dying, and I know I'm kind of rushing through this. And if you have questions, please ask. But lastly, there's a decision in verse number three. He says, "Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent." Now, right there, he says, "There's a decision to make." He says, you need to remember where you came from and remember what you're supposed to do and you need to change the ways you are now. That's how I know this church was in decline because John says, repent. Repent means to turn away from or turn around. Now, if you look at this, he says there, there's two choices. You can either go the way you're going. He says, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. There is judgment. And, and, and historically, there was judgment here. Now, he says, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what, what hour I will come upon thee. But then he says, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, you have this, this decision that you have to make. If you found yourself in this in some form or fashion, you have to decide, am I going to act or am I not going to act? Am I going to serve the Lord or am I not going to serve the Lord? This decision is apparent, and it's it's given to every church except for the next church, the Church of Philadelphia. There's no repentance given there. And what you have is you have John saying there's judgment if you don't repent, and if you do repent and you do change your ways, then there is you know you're you're going to walk with me. There's going to be fellowship, and. So many times in the Christian life, you, you put yourself in a spot or you'll find yourself in a spot where that is the case. You may have gone to a, to, to a place and maybe you're not where you should be with the Lord. And just like, you know, you would chastise your child. God's going to, you know, he's going to chastise you. But at the same time, if you'll just turn yourself around and get back where you need to be with the Lord, then then you'll be in a good spot. I saw a thing on Facebook the other day. Uh, one of my preacher's friends shared. One of my preacher friends shared, and it said, "Doesn't matter how far you walk away from God, the return trip is always one step." And that's that's true. God is always there waiting. So this church at Sardis, it was it had a reputation for being alive, but it was dead. And that just goes to show you, you can't look on what's outside, but it all comes down to what's inside. They had a duty. Those that were still serving had a duty to be watchful and strengthen them. But that decision they had to make that was key. 99% of the Christian life is responding when someone gives you a decision to make. 99% of the Christian life is responding whenever God uh, says, this is what I need you to do. Success depends on how you answer this question. That's all I've got for today. That was a church at Sardis, and, uh, and that, that was a church of the living dead. And next week, we're going to talk about the church of Philadelphia. And uh, that is a church that God never had a bad thing to say about. And uh, it's an amazing church. And then after we get through that, we have that last church, Church of Laodicea. And then I'm going to go back and talk about how these were times in church history and, and how that's one of the theories about these churches. That's all I've got for today, though. God bless you guys. We love you. And Lord willing, we'll see you soon.